Well, <clears throat> welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're crossing a boundary uh, sort of fault line uh, in the book uh, as we move into spirit uh, this week. Uh, it's pretty clear that when Hegel set out to write the book, he hadn't had in mind to write this part of the book uh, under the original title, The Science of the Experience of Consciousness. Uh, what, what he explicitly envisaged was clearly a discussion of empirical consciousness, uh, our knowledge of the external world. Uh, second, a treatment of normativity and selfhood, uh, that is self-consciousness, and then a discussion of reason, uh, purposive agency. Uh, last time I passed on uh, a passage from late in the book, from the religion chapter, after the uh, after he'd written the spirit part of the book, uh, in which he's retrospectively describing uh, the structure of the book and says, well, we went through these uh, three aspects uh, of Geist sequentially, uh, consciousness, self-consciousness, and reason. Now we need to break uh, that into the three parts and rebundle them, line them up, talk about the whole of spirit, not just uh, its uh, aspects. Um, remember last time uh, I suggested that the debates that there have been ever since about the unity uh, of the book and in particular about his intentions uh, might usefully be considered from the point of view of his own official view of intention, according to which you know, we should say this was not uh, the, the book that he wrote was not something he explicitly envisaged at the beginning. It was not part of his Vorsatz, uh, but it was part of the intention, the object uh, with which uh, he wrote it. It's just to determine that uh, intention, you have to see how the Vorsatz works itself out in the concrete circumstances uh, in which one is uh, acting. But in particular, uh, nothing I think that one uh, reads in the first uh, half of the book prepares one for the main topic of the spirit uh, section, uh, the spirit chapter that is as long as what uh, preceded it, namely the discussion of uh, the one biggest thing that ever happened in human history, according to Hegel, the transition from traditional forms of life to modern forms of life. Uh, that's the topic. Uh, that's the topic here. Uh, and uh, along with that change in topic is an interesting change in uh, the literary form uh, of the book. It's still an allegory. But where uh, the allegories that we saw in the first half, beginning with uh, the notion of force uh, in, at the end of the consciousness section, but continuing through the discussion of lordship and bondage and uh, the different forms uh, of agency, those were Hegel's conceits. Uh, but now in the spirit section, the allegories that we're gonna read are literary productions of the very periods of time that he's talking about. They are the allegories in terms of which these ages uh, understood themselves. Uh, today, we're talking about the ancient, uh, uh, the ancient Greek world, uh, but we'll see that he talks about literary works essentially of his own time in order to talk about uh, modernity, the shattered, uh, the shattered consciousness. Uh, and I think it's worth reminding ourselves how remarkable uh, the task of pulling these threads together under the heading of the vast sea change from traditional forms of life and the kind of normativity that was implicit in them to modern forms of life and the normative kind of normativity implicit in it, just how remarkable uh, an intellectual achievement this was. So in the initial uh, 
discussion of the three aspects of Geist, uh, the traditional form, what, what we can now recognize as the, the form to be overcome, in epistemology was a restriction to sense universals, uh, to sense certainty and perception. Uh, and that restriction to sense universals means that we're not discussing uh, the essentially modern notion of postulating theoretical entities that are related by subjunctively robust explanation supporting laws. Uh, that's what he's uh, taking to be the essential innovation of the scientific revolution. Uh, and he's retrospectively contrasting uh, the restriction to sense universals in sense certainty and perception with that modern notion. In the normativity uh, discussion of self-consciousness, uh, the traditional form of normativity and so selfhood is the asymmetric structure of authority and responsibility as subordination and obedience, whose allegory is the master and the slave, uh, but whose implementation he follows out uh, uh, in the discussion at, at the end of uh, this first part of spirit, uh, through liter from literal slavery through feudal Europe to uh, the aristocratic uh, uh, form of subordination and obedience, uh, essentially of his own uh, of his own time, uh, and the image of this um, uh, traditional form of normativity is the great chain of being. Well, one might well ask oneself, what do those two things have in common? with one another, his diagnosis of the rise of the scientific revolution in terms of uh, theoretical entities and uh, the lawful relations among them on the one hand, and the move from asymmetric relations of authority and responsibility of subordination and obedience to uh, more egalitarian, small r, Republican, liberal, uh, uh, forms of authority and responsibility that we see on uh, the modern political side. And along the third dimension, agency, a practical agency under the heading of reason, uh, though this is something we'll actually not even talk about today, uh, it, it's still to come, uh, the traditional form is epitomized in the heroic, tragic self-consciousness that Hegel discusses using the self-conscious literary um, allegory of Sophocles' Oedipus uh, trilogy. Really the two um, through, throughout Hegel's writing, not just in the phenomenology, uh, it's Sophocles' Antigone and uh, his Oedipus that are the um, literary works that he discusses. Um, we'll see that uh, Hegel has specific views, not only about the uh, relation of, uh, but where Sophocles stands relative to Aeschylus and Euripides, uh, but even about the literary development within the uh, Oedipus trilogy. Uh, he sees a progression from Oedipus to uh, Oedipus at Kelowna uh, at the end of it. The traditional heroic tragic consciousness, he says, doesn't make the distinction between Handlung and Tat, doesn't accept and attribute responsibility only for what the agent knew she was doing, uh, intended to do, doesn't recognize what he calls uh, the rights of knowledge uh, and intention. And I'll, I'll have a lot more to say about this distinction and transition from the heroic, tragic uh, Oedipal conception to the modern forms of self-conscious practical agency, because I see this as at the core of the transition to the third postmodern phase of uh, Hegelian history. But again, we can ask, uh, how does this distinction in practical agency line up with 
the others. Uh, what is it that the scientific revolution has in common with uh, something like the democratic liberal uh, revolution, a, a shift to more symmetric egalitarian normative structures via the appreciation of the fundamental character of reciprocal recognitive relations and the shift to assigning, accepting and attributing responsibility only for what's within the individual's control, what they self-consciously, explicitly intend and know will be the consequences of their doings. But all of these Hegel claims are aspects of one single transition, the advent of modernity. And this is bold and astonishing. Uh, while uh, all of the great uh, early modern philosophers uh, in the canon from Descartes to Kant uh, were uh, moving modernity forward, the theoretical self-consciousness uh, that is distinctively modern, they were articulating it. But Hegel is the first one uh, who really takes modernity as his topic, uh, as an explicit theme. And he does so in uh, this spirit chapter. Uh, people realized you know, that there was a scientific revolution going on. Uh, they could see the French Revolution and uh, the Napoleonic Wars uh, were a political uh, revolution. You know, Wordsworth, uh, who was born the very same year that Hegel was, uh, 1770, uh, spoke about his generation in the prelude. Uh, he said, bliss was it in that dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. Uh, you're a teenager during the French, uh, during the French Revolution. You see the world changing. Uh, around you. But what that had to do with uh, enlightenment, uh, with the scientific revolution, um, uh, hard to say. One of uh, Napoleon's uh, slogans for the change he was bringing politically to Europe that he always insisted was uh, to institute Republican forms uh, of government, that is forms of self-government, even as he evolved to crown himself uh, emperor, was that instead of aristocratic uh, subordination, uh, superior subordinate relations, we would have carrière ouverte au talent, uh, political careers that were open to talent instead of to birth. And in his uh, biography uh, of Hegel, which uh, I seriously recommend, Terry Pinkard relates how Hegel was reported to the C Prussian secret police uh, for having uttered that phrase in a lecture. He used the phrase, carrière ouverte au talon. Uh, and that was considered treason in the Prussian, uh, in the Prussian state. That was uh, subversive of aristocratic control to think about political careers that were open uh, to talent. The sort of thing that led, uh, the, the idea that led Napoleon to institute the polytechnics as alternatives to the ossified universities as places where those talent could be trained. Uh, anyway, Hegel was reported to the secret police for using this phrase. Anyone else would have been jailed uh, for doing so. He didn't deny that he had used this uh, phrase, but he was sufficiently eminent uh, and politically connected even as the philosophy professor at uh, what would become the Humboldt uh, uh, University that uh, the secret police were told he was untouchable. So they arrested his principal student um, uh, and said, they needed to send the message. That was what they did. Uh, and uh, Pinkard relates how Hegel had himself rowed out onto the Spree, the, the river uh, in Berlin, to talk to the student through the, uh, uh, through the bars, uh, saying, look, there's no reason you should be in prison. Let, you know, let me 
put myself forward and take this on myself. And the students said, oh, you know, they do this all the time. In a few days, they'll let me out. Really, Professor, don't uh, uh, discommode yourself about this. Well, this uh, exchange was overheard uh, and the secret police wanted to know, well, what did they say? And the jailer said, well, he couldn't really tell you that uh, because Hegel had taken the precaution of conducting the discussion entirely in Latin and the, the uh, uh, jailer uh, couldn't get it. So, so uh, he Hegel saw uh, modernity as one phenomenon that had these different economic, political, uh, uh, scientific uh, aspects and instituted the, the study of that. Uh, and this was hugely influential in uh, the 19th century, basically invention of the social sciences, uh, the task of understanding the problematic of the advent of modernity is basically uh, the original task of sociology, uh, you know, as we see um, uh, coming to um, uh, maturity in Max Weber, uh, but in uh, people like Ferdinand Tönnies, uh, who is the uh, originator of the Gemeinschaft Gesellschaft uh, distinction as a way of thinking about the transition from traditional communities to uh, modern societies. Uh, Durkheim, Zimmel, obviously Marx, uh, but less obviously, uh, uh, we could see Adam Smith uh, as on the economic side doing this. Ranke, the greatest of the German uh, historians probably ever, but anyway, of the 19th century, th this was absolutely central to his uh, conception. Oh. And I think it's worth remembering that the sociological division within Anglophone philosophy between its analytic and its continental wings has as something like its philosophical core, a divergence just over whether you take this to be a central philosophical issue, the advent of uh, modernity. The continental wing always has taken that as an important task. And it's something like definitive of the, uh, of the analytic wing to reject that as not a philosophical issue. Uh, I mean, interestingly, and I think that, that that's the, the sort of philosophical core that's merely extensionally expressed in the question of whether one takes Hegel seriously as a, uh, a philosopher or not. Uh, even though I think these are extensionally equivalent. And I think it's interesting that by and large, this was not a central issue of the absolute idealists, the British idealists and their American followers like Royce. Um, they were non-trivially motivated by something like a reactionary attempt to pursue or retain religion in the face of the modern onslaught of uh, Darwinian evolutionary theory, uh, less concerned uh, with modernity as uh, itself uh, a topic. Some of the later ones, Collingwood, maybe more concerned uh, with that. But this uh, uh, divide between, uh, okay, so, uh, I mean, I think it's a live question uh, how good an idea this was. Uh, that is that there was sort of one thing happening uh, which uh, had all of these different uh, manifestations. Uh, clearly, it was an important idea, uh, but you know, in the end, what should we make of it uh, philosophically? Uh, and it's here, I think Hegel's thought is, well, what they were all aspects of uh, is a change in the fundamental structure of normativity. Uh, it's an issue about the metaphysics of normativity. That's why it's the historicity of Geist uh, that uh, he's considering the metaphysics of Geist. And his idea that um, the Kantian 
categories, the, the meta concepts in terms of which we uh, understand our conceptual activity uh, are one manifestation, the sort of self-conscious form of the structures of normativity and economic and political uh, ones are practical uh, forms of that. That was the, um, that was the idea. Um, and here, what we see in uh, the spirit section is uh, his account of the first glimmerings of modernity, uh, the first changes in practice that were reflected in uh, the beginnings of a self-conscious appreciation uh, that uh, we were and needed to move beyond traditional uh, forms of life. And here, I think a model for the sort of story he's telling us about those first glimmerings of modernity already in the classic age uh, of Greece uh, is Arthur Lovejoy, uh, uh, tw early 20th century American, uh, in the, the vanguard of uh, American intellectual historians, uh, and who, for instance, uh, wrote witheringly about pragmatism, I think, in his essay on that, he distinguishes 19 different things that people have meant uh, by the term pragmatism. He's suggesting this is disreputable, but he also has an essay in which he sees the first glimmerings of romanticism uh, in uh, Europe, in the fad, the sudden popularity uh, on the European continent of English gardens uh, in the late 1700s, where instead of the formal geometric uh, French gardens that uh, Versailles uh, uh, made famous, the anarchic English gardens uh, uh, became popular. And Lovejoy, I think, is telling and insightful about how you could already see before Goethe uh, uh, was writing, never mind before the uh, real fleury of uh, romanticism in Jena at Hegel's time, you could already see the sensibility as beginning to peak. Uh, through here in that change in the popularity of gardens. And Hegel is going to say something like that about Greek tragedy, that uh, there's a sense in which the first stirrings of modern self-consciousness and of the breakdown of traditional uh, forms of normativity uh, can already be discerned in uh, the great tragedians. And the reason, if you look at this sort of uh, admittedly a bit idiosyncratic um, first page of the handout, um, uh, Hegel has the view that uh, Aeschylus, the, the oldest of the, of the trinity of tragedians, Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides, that uh, he sees as in many ways paralleling uh, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, uh, anticipating them, but you know, speaking for a popular uh, audience, that Aeschylus was not modern at all. Uh, he articulated the traditional uh, form of life. Uh, Euripides, he thinks, is essentially a modern uh, playwright, uh, that the modern sensibility has come to uh, serious self-consciousness in Euripides. And Sophocles, in between them, uh, goes both ways. He's basically articulating the traditional uh, line of thought, but uh, the topics that he addresses are all about uh, the upwellings of what Hegel can see as um, 
distinctively modern uh, uh, forms of life and self-understanding. And so Sophocles is the one who's most interesting uh, to Hegel. And uh, what I want to talk about at the end uh, of this session is the irony that he sees uh, in uh, Sophocles bringing these things to self-consciousness in the sense that he puts them out there for the audience. But it's not clear that Sophocles himself understood uh, what he was making explicit to the audience. Uh, and this uh, is one of the things that Hegel uses the romantic Schlegel notion of irony to, uh, uh, to talk about. Um, now, it, it is uh, a fascinating feature of this trilogy of uh, great tragedians that something like their principal topic was the royal family of Thebes, uh, whose complex genealogy uh, uh, I put a picture of in the, uh, in the handout. Uh, you should particularly admire, uh, oh, here I can, uh, you should particularly admire the uh, diagonal, uh, the hypotenuse between Jocasta and Oedipus there, the sort of complicated uh, situation. But Antigone, who we're going to talk about, is uh, the product of that, uh, uh, of that union. Uh, this family tree is something like the... Um, uh, Marvel universe of these tragedians. Uh, they obsessively write uh, about this so that, for instance, um, uh, Aeschylus writes the play Seven Against Thebes, which is about uh, the brothers, Polynices and Ateocles, uh, fighting, killing, e killing each other. Uh, it, it ends with their deaths. Uh, off stage, and Sophocles comes along and writes the Antigone about sort of the next generation of that uh, story. Sophocles is also writing the Oedipus uh, trilogy, uh, uh, which is uh, upstream uh, 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 from that. And uh, we know that uh, Euripides wrote an Antigone, a rethinking of Sophocles' story of the Antigone, uh, which in particular made a major figure of Haman, Creon's son, uh, in parallel to Antigone. But this play is lost. And the reports uh, that we have of it, I gather it's even controversial, whether it's uh, Euripides' Antigone or another minor, fig minor playwright's uh, Antigone that we have some uh, reports of. But uh, uh, they sort of obsessively retold the story. It was the canvas on which uh, their, as Hegel would have it, normative self-consciousness uh, uh, played out. Um, okay. Uh, so I want to talk about the historicity uh, of Geist. Because though it's something like conventional wisdom that uh, where Kant thought there was just one set of categories uh, forever and for all, uh, that Hegel thought they changed. Uh, and he does, but that's because he's broadened the notion of uh, categories to the structure of Geist, the metaphysics of uh, normativity. Uh, now, here's a famous uh, statement of Hegel's from um, the philosophy of right, uh, paragraph 343. He says, the history of Geist is its own act. Geist is only what it does. And its act is to make itself the object of its own consciousness. In history, its act is to gain consciousness of itself as Geist. 
to apprehend itself in its interpretation of itself to itself. This apprehension is its being and its principle. And the completion of apprehension at one stage is at the same time the rejection of that stage and its transition to a higher. To use abstract phraseology, the Geist apprehending this apprehension anew, or in other words, returning to itself out again out of its rejection of this lower stage of apprehension, is the Geist of the stage higher than that on which it stood in its earlier apprehension. That's the end of uh, the quote. Um, he, other places, uses the phrase, uh, talks about history as history is the progress of the consciousness of freedom. Uh, what he's recounting to us is the history of the progress of the consciousness of freedom. Parenthetically, uh, I've obsessed about you know, Hegel for long enough that when my younger son was in junior high school, he heard this phrase and was sufficiently taken with it, that it was something like the third name of their ongoing garage band uh, was history of the consciousness of the progress of freedom. Uh, eventually they just used the initials uh, for it. And uh, you'll never hear any of their music, but um, he was taken with the title. Um, there really are just three stages in uh, Hegelian history. Uh, there's traditional society. Uh, what we're going to be talking about today under the heading of immediate Zittlichkeit. And I'll say something more about that word later on. It's a view about the relation of normative statuses to normative attitudes, as I would understand it, uh, and a view about agency selves and their relation to community. Uh, and that contrasts with the modern modern society, uh, which is also a view about the relation of norm, normative statuses to normative attitudes. Uh, roughly, uh, the traditional view uh, sees normative statuses as objective features of the world and normative attitudes as more or less accurate reflections of them. Um, sees normative statuses as authoritative over normative attitudes and the attitudes as responsible to the norms. And the modern view reverses that uh, and sees normative norms, normative statuses as instituted by normative attitudes. Uh, where the traditional society uh, understands the sense in which we're made into the people we are by the norms. Uh, I am my station and its duties. Uh, the modern insight is uh, that we make the norms, that, that ultimately the norms are our uh, products. And he thinks that's uh, a substantial advance in self-consciousness, uh, but that it comes with a price, the worm in the apple of modernity uh, is a certain kind of distancing from the norms, uh, a practical inability to see them as binding on us precisely insofar as we see them as our products. And the challenge then that he sees for himself as a philosopher, uh, but for us as uh, discursive beings is to get together uh, in one uh, coherent picture, the sense in which we're the products of the norms of the community we're born into, and the sense in which the norms are the products of the practices and attitudes of uh, uh, those community members. Uh, how can we do equal justice to those, uh, to those two views? So if you look um, on the handout at the uh, 
mm, at the terminology, uh, Zitta is customs. Uh, the Wittgensteinian phrase for this is customs, uses, institutions, mores, the social practices, uh, that's the Zitta, ethos. Uh, and, and is that, uh, that's the excuse for the English translators uh, calling Zittlichkeit uh, ethical life. Uh, now that's misleading if you think of ethical as sort of high flown, specifically moral normativity, it isn't. It's uh, the practical norms implicit in uh, the practices, the customs of uh, the community. Uh, and here I think the telling um, passage, what observation knew as a given object in which the self had no part is here the given custom, the zitta. Uh, there's a parallel between uh, empirical givenness of knowledge on the one hand, uh, immediate sensuous immediacy as intrinsically authoritative, having owing nothing to our conceptual activity. And in the case of uh, immediate uh, the view epitomized uh, and brought to self-consciousness, uh, to its kind of self-consciousness by the ancient Greeks, uh, it's custom on the side of the norms, uh, a given the given norms in which the self had no part, that they're not our products. And what he talks about as Zittlichkeit, they say usually translated ethical life. I'm just gonna leave it in his uh, term, uh, in his terminology, it is a matter of the bindingness, the normative force of uh, uh, the norms. And that's what, tends to go missing in the modern picture, the sense of the norms as rationally binding on us uh, that he calls alienation. Uh, uh, so while we're in the uh, vicinity, uh, two terms that he uses here, uh, They've come up before in the book, but but here's where he really gives the gives the sort of defining use of them, and it's very important when we finally come around and read the preface of the book to understand these terms with the sense that he gives them here. Uh, substance and essence, uh, when we're talking about the side of subjectivity, uh, the side of normativity, rather than the side of uh, the objective uh, world. Uh, substance is the community and its implicit normative practices, which are the zeta. Um, and essence is the normativity, uh, the norms that are implicit in those practices. Uh, and whatever extent we're self-conscious about those norms, uh, the terms in which we're uh, self-conscious about them is um, uh, an aspect of the essence of the norms, uh, of the norms themselves. So in these terms then, the three stages of Hegelian history are Zittlichkeit, identification with the norms that made us what we are, uh, but no modern individually self-conscious subjectivity. Um, and you know, it, it's not that uh, he's claiming the ancient Greeks were zombies, uh, but there is a kind of individual self-consciousness that they didn't have, he says. Uh, and the modern stage, stage two, uh, modern individual self-consciousness is uh, achieved, but at the cost of alienation. If you want to think uh, just roughly about this change uh, to 
modernity. Uh, think about the shift from identifying yourself with, in Bradley's useful uh, phrase, my station and its duties, uh, as opposed to a modern persona. Uh, persona is Latin for mask. Uh, the modern self-conscious individual is a substrate that plays different roles, uh, that on the one hand is a parent, on the other hand is a citizen, uh, a member of uh, a guild, uh, but um, uh, also you know, a, a devotee of this sport uh, or a member of this political party or this uh, uh, religious confession. Uh, anyway, stage three, the postmodern uh, phase that Hegel thinks of himself as something like the Moses of, will bring us to the gates of the promised land, but is destined not himself to enter it, is a reachievement of Zittlichkeit in a way that is compatible with individual self conscious subjectivity, uh, the overcoming of. Um, uh, alienation. And because he thinks the Owl of Minerva flies only at dusk, uh, we can't say very much uh, about that. He can uh, intellectually describe it for us, but uh, instantiating it requires changing the kind of recognitive community we have, the kind of institutions we live in, uh, and that we can only look forward to and can't see how things will look when we actually live in uh, communities like that. So um, I've offered uh, uh, a proleptic catechism here, uh, seven questions that uh, we ought to have answered uh, about uh, this historicity. Uh, what is it that the traditional forms of life got right and what did they get wrong? Uh, what is it that modernity learned? What did we gain? In what sense is it that uh, self-conscious individual selves are distinctively modern? Uh, what is the traditional pre-modern Zittlichkeit? What is alienation? Uh, why did individual self-consciousness bring with it alienation? Uh, so why couldn't pre-modern people be alienated? Uh, and how are we to understand the last uh, stage, the getting together of uh, the insight uh, of uh, a zitlich identification with the norms, together with the modern appreciation of the norms as our product. Uh, and finally, the, the place where this is really going to be focused is on the conception of agency. Uh, there's a kind of reachievement of the heroic tragic Oedipal, uh, the heroic tragic conception of agency. Uh, which takes responsibility for the act in all of its uh, manifestations. Uh, there's a kind of reachievement of that uh, that's supposed to be compatible with making the distinction between what was done intentionally uh, and what was not. Uh, and how are we to think about that form of agency, that, that form of being uh, a person? So. Today, we're only gonna talk about the first, uh, the first stage of that, uh, but this is where uh, we're going. Uh, yeah. So I guess my next topic is going to be the immediate Zidlichite, immediacy about the norms, but let me stop in case there are questions or comments at this point. Yeah, Sequoia. 
Uh, yeah, since we're entering in this historical uh, uh, questioning, I had two questions I was hoping maybe you could clear up. The first one is, do you know why so much emphasis was placed on the French Revolution and not other revolutionary movements like the American Revolution or the Corsican Revolution or like other democratic revolutions? Number one, uh, or maybe answer that and then I'll ask my second question. Okay, yeah. uh, well, actually, I mean, the French Revolution was uh, a big deal. Uh, you know, people saw it uh, evolving into Napoleon. Um, once you had uh, uh, overthrown the Ancien Regime in uh, France, Napoleon was uh, exporting that, you know, was seen and saw, saw himself as exporting that uh, modern political form to the rest of the world. Uh, so that that was history happening there. And remember, that's happening right around Hegel. He can see the soldiers of modernity uh, at, out, out at the edge of the, uh, of the city. But we now know that actually the revolution that meant at least as much to him as the French Revolution was the Haitian Revolution uh, of 1806, that he read an English language periodical uh, that followed week by week the slave revolt in Haiti, the only successful slave revolt in the history of the world, that the only one where the slaves without uh, external help uh, achieved more than just uh, uh, an immediate uh, victory, but actually instituted their own uh, their own country. And uh, there, there's interesting research uh, now. I'm not just at the moment coming up with the name of the woman who has done uh, the work on this, but uh, if you Google the Haitian Revolution and Hegel, you will find. Uh, her all over it, uh, that this was just massively uh, uh, significant for Hegel's own thinking uh, when he's writing the Lordship and Bondage uh, uh, section, but uh, you know, on into the bits uh, after that. Okay, thanks. And then my second question uh, actually is, comes out of your presentation of this normative development of spirit. And it made me ask me a, myself a question that I've never thought of before. Um, why spirit? I mean, why does, does he does, call it? Why does he yeah, call does, it? Does dice? it come from Montesquieu's spirit of the laws, or uh, is it like the spirit of the times? Or do you have? Do you know why? Why spirit? Uh, I, I don't have a specific view about that. It's um, clearly downstream of as so much of what. Uh, he writes is of the book that uh, was the first recent philosophy that really set the young Hegel on fire as a 17 year old in the Stift, which was Kant's religion within the bounds of reason alone. Uh, and he, you know, he, he wrote a letter uh, back home that we have from that saying, Look, this is exactly right. Uh, the only thing that Kant doesn't see is that Fantasie, Herz, and Sinnlichkeit must not be sent empty away. That uh, imagination, uh, heart, and the sensuous uh, are their significance in religion are being underestimated uh, here. And his uh, writings about religion and about art uh, are specifically about sort of that significance. Anyway, he clearly has in mind uh, that uh, the philosophical core of traditional religion, particularly as he's thinking, you know, his uh, pietist uh, version of Lutheranism, of Lutheran Protestantism, uh, what it's really philosophically about, clothed in a sensuous uh, covering, uh, is 
discursive normativity. Uh, and so uses a term for that that's going to let him sort of speak on both sides of the religion, non-religion uh, uh, side. So he interprets the, the Trinity in terms of uh, universality, particularity, and individuality, where Geist is the, the union of all of, uh, of all of those. Yes, Natalie. Um, we may get to this as we go through your questions, but um, to the question, why couldn't pre-modern people be alienated? Um, I wonder if what Hegel is has been talk, had been talking about with ancient stoicism and ancient skepticism isn't a species of some kind of alienation. Yeah, I don't know. That's too deep and complicated a question for me to, uh, for me to address. Uh, he certainly thinks of stoicism and skepticism as already uh, expressions of modern uh, sensibilities and forms of self-consciousness within the ancient world. As he sees them as seriously late coming relative to uh, the uh, plays of Sophocles, say, that he's, uh, that he's talking about here. Uh, exactly how uh, he's uh, going to relate them to the story that he's telling about the tragedians I don't know. That's an interesting question. Uh, uh, I, I don't have a quick answer to it. Okay. Uh, so here my topic is the immediacy of norms, the way they're construed and portrayed in uh, these tragedies that he's thinking of as uh, expressions of this of the form of self consciousness that was compatible with uh, immediate uh, uh, zitlichkeit, uh, and we could at least label the problem of why uh, alienation was not possible in this context by saying. Uh, being at a distance from the norms was being evil, not being alienated uh, at this point. Uh, one's job was to uh, bring one's attitudes and in particular one's practical attitudes expressed in one's doings in line with uh, what is fitting with uh, the norms. Uh, so he says, of the laws as they appear to themselves, as they appear to immediate Zittlichkeit, maybe we want the, uh, and out again here, yeah. That they appear to immediate Zittlichkeit as unalienated spirits transparent to themselves stainless celestial figures that preserve in all their differences the undefiled innocence and harmony of their essential nature. Now, essential there is the norms. Um, and he's talking about the simple harmony, uh, undivided. Uh, the relationship of self-consciousness to them is equally simple and clear, still quoting. They are the norms how it is fitting, how it is appropriate to act, they are and nothing more. This is what constitutes the awareness of its relationship to them. That is acknowledging their authority, being responsible to them. They are independent, authoritative. You, the individual, are responsible to them, dependent uh, on them. Thus, he says, Sophocles Antigone acknowledges them as the unwritten and infallible laws of the gods. They are not of yesterday or today, but everlasting. Though where they come from, none of us can tell. This is a quote from the play. By the way, I put uh, uh, in the website a link to a good modern 
translation of the plays, in case you want to look at it. See, they are. The norms, the laws, they just are. If I inquire after their origin and confine them to the point whence they arose, then I've transcended them. For now it's I who am the universal and they're the conditioned and limited. If they're supposed to be validated by my insight, then I've already denied their unshakable intrinsic being and regard them as something which for me is perhaps true, but also is perhaps not true. Ethical zitlich disposition consists just in sticking steadfastly to what's right and abstaining from all attempts to move or shake it or derive it, or he say, inquire into its origins uh, or even really its nature. Um, the terminology that he uses for this attitude of individual self-consciousness to uh, the norms is character. And Zitlich traditional character contrasts with the modern personhood, the persona, the wearer of masks. Um, Zitlichkeit requires that the practitioners identify with the norms that govern their practice. Now, remember, we saw already in the uh, discussion of lordship and bondage in the struggle unto death, um, uh, that Hegelian identification with something is risk and sacrifice for it. And Zitlich identification is accordingly willingness to risk and sacrifice for the norms, for what's really fitting, appropriate, or correct, what the laws demand, what one is in fact obliged or committed to do, one's duty as determined by one's station. And we say, well, now, what is it that's risked and sacrificed for those norms, for the laws? Well, it's the particular contingent subjective attitudes of the practitioners, their preferences, their idiosyncratic subjective uh, preferences. And that sort of identification with the laws, the normative statuses, at the sacrifice of one's own practical attitudes and preferences, that's what he calls character. And that's the defining uh, relation to uh, the norms that defines it, the relation constitutive of immediate zitlichkeit. Uh, not to do that is to do wrong, to be evil. Uh, he says, this is at 597, uh, immediate zitlik consciousness, which knows its duty and does it, and is bound up with it as its own nature. That's his, sort of my station and its duties. Uh, so individuals in traditional society understand themselves as being what they are because of the norms they're bound by. Uh, not being bound by those norms would be not to be uh, who you are. Acknowledging immediate acknowledgement of the authority of those norms over particular attitudes, which of course is not to say that one never does what's wrong, but one doesn't think that that somehow has an effect on whether what one's doing is wrong or not. You're treating the norms essentially as found rather than as made and not seeing yourself as having any kind of corresponding authority over the norms. They're just part of the objectively given furniture of the world. They are. Uh, what they don't see, the, the modern insight, is the contribution that their own activity, that our own activity collectively makes to instituting those norms. They don't see what William James called the trail of the human serpent overall. Uh, that's a distinctively modern uh, thought. And one aspect of the identification of the normative with the natural that's characteristic of immediate zitlichkeit, something that's simply there, is that on this implicit practical conception of the normative, 
the idea of conflicting norms is unintelligible. If there's a conflict, it has to be merely apparent. Uh, it can't be real. Someone can no more have incompatible obligations than any object can have incompatible properties. That's part of what they're being just there like an object is. That contrasts with modern personhood, where we get used to the idea that uh, the obligations that go with one of the roles I play may come in conflict with the obligations uh, that come with some other role that I play, that my obligations uh, as a member of my family may conflict with my professional obligations uh, or with uh, my religious uh, obligations. Uh, this modern picture of someone who occupies different roles, plays different roles, wears different masks, that's a modern uh, uh, idea. And that's why in the allegory, in the play, Creon and Antigone uh, practically embodying different laws, Creon, the law of the polis, the, the community, uh, the political community, and uh, Antigone, the law of the family, uh, of the natural community, they can't see that their conflict involves two rights, two duties, two laws that conflict with one another. That the immediacy of their relation to what's right uh, makes that an unintelligible characterization of what's going on. Now, one of them is not doing what the law demands, the law. And, and yet, uh, Sophocles is making that collision of two laws, uh, the human law embodied in the family uh, and the social law embodied in the, in the polis, uh, He's making visible to the audience that there really are two rights there, two laws in conflict, and that it's not that Antigone is right and Creon is wrong or the other way around. And in that, we see an eruption of modernity, of what Hegel, who wants us to look back and understand what's going on better than they understood themselves, uh, can see in. Uh, one instance of the irony, the difference between the self-consciousness of the audience, their understanding of what's going on, and the understanding of the people who are involved, who, who are on the proscenium, who are on uh, the stage, who can't uh, understand this. So he says uh, uh, at 476, this ruin of Zitlichen substance and its passage into another form is thus determined by the fact that the Zitlich consciousness is directed onto the law in a way that's essentially immediate. This determination of immediacy means that nature as such enters into the ethical Zitlich act, the reality of which simply reveals the contradiction and the germ of destruction inherent in the beautiful harmony and tranquil equilibrium of the Zitlich spirit itself. So I want to talk about, I want to sort of fill in this picture of uh, immediate Zitlichkeit uh, uh, under, under two headings. Uh, one, the family, uh, and two, gender essentialism. Uh, the, the sense in which uh, merely natural distinctions between men and women are treated as having intrinsically normative significance, as being the very paradigm of natural normative distinctions. Uh, that's the uh, fundamental misunderstanding of uh, 
immediate Sittlichkeit. So here, under the heading of the family, uh, the family is amphibious. It's a natural community, uh, and it's a normative unit. Uh, it's the very first form of association, uh, of recognition. Uh, it involves naturally asymmetric relations of authority and responsibility between parents and children, uh, which become the image for the relation between uh, lord and slave or king and subject. Uh, and for the religious, uh, you know, God is our father, but also the Lord. Uh, uh, the family is the uh, origin uh, of all this. Uh, it's transitional between nature and spirit. It's both a natural unit and the first normative recognitive uh, community. So here, uh, Hegel says, these things are all on the uh, passages are all on the handout. However, although the family is de immediately determined as an ethical being, as zitlich, it is within itself a zitlich entity only so far as it is not the natural relation of its members. This natural relationship is just as much a spiritual one, a geistic one. And it's only as a spiritual entity that it's zitlich, ethical. The ethical principle must be placed in the relation of the individual member of the family to the whole family as the substance. Now, the substance here is the community, remember. So we're thinking about the family as a unity, as a unit of substance. Um, so there are, uh, as always in recognitive communities, internal differences that make up the unity of the family. It's essentially internally articulated by things playing different roles. Uh, the relation between parent and child and between male and female in the family. Uh, and those internal differences, like the family itself, are both natural differences and intrinsically normative differences, at least according to the understanding of immediate Zittlichkeit. Uh, and, and, and that's the mistake that's made is to think that natural differences could be intrinsically normatively significant. Uh, but it's in the family that Hegel thinks we find the origin of the idea that normative distinctions are natural objective ones. This is the origin of the reification of norms, the objectification of them. What in the useful term Marx will give us for this later on, the fetishization of them. Fetishism for Marx is mistaking features that are actually products of the role something plays in our social practices for intrinsic objective properties uh, of them. And the family is where it all begins. So he says in, at 459, the two sexes overcome their merely natural being and appear in their ethical significance as diverse beings who share between them the two distinctions belonging to Zitlik substance. These two universal beings of the ethical world, Zitlik world, have, therefore, their specific individuality and naturally distinct self-consciousnesses. Because the Zitlik spirit is the immediate unity of the substance with self-consciousness. The Zitlik spirit is the immediate unity of the substance, the community that is the family, with self-consciousness an immediacy which appears therefore both from the side of reality and of difference as the existence of a natural difference. It's now the specific antithesis of the two sexes 
whose natural existence acquires at the same time the significance of their ethical Zitlik determination. And six paragraphs later at 465, he says, nature, not the accident of circumstance or choice, assigns one sex to one law, the other to the other law. This is the idea at once constitutive of this form of life and uh, the little rift within the lute that by and by, that ever widen, that by and by shall make the music mute and ever widening slowly silence all. That's Tennyson. Uh, this is what will break apart this uh, natural harmony, this uh, mistaken practical idea, form of self-consciousness that treats merely natural distinctions as intrinsically normatively significant. Uh, and he's seeing it as having uh, the two essential Confucian dimensions, uh, the paternal filial sort of vertical uh, asymmetric relation of parent to child and the fraternal, uh, the recognitive relation between uh, brother and sister uh, that actually is the way forward. It's uh, what, Antigone is uh, speaking for uh, here. Now, the contrast that uh, we're, we're going to follow out in the allegory is between the two forms of substance, the two forms of community, the family and the polis. Uh, the polis is a pure, well, it's the purest, most modern recognitive uh, community in the Greek situation. But an absolutely crucial thing to appreciate is that the members of the polis are not individual human beings. The members of the polis are the families. A polis is a community of families. The pater familias speaks for the family, but the whole family is responsible uh, uh, as a unit. Uh, it's not just uh, the individual. And this goes on through uh, Roman times uh, where, uh, again, the pater familias speaks for the family, but the unit uh, whose relation with other units at the same level makes up the community, that the political community is the family. And the picture is that the family is the original, minimal, natural form of Geistig substance of community. And the polis is constructed recognitively out of that uh, in an essentially uh, symmetric and in principle anyway, symmetric relation uh, among the families. And this is the origin of asymmetric subordination, obedience forms of normativity is within the family, but those get reflected into uh, the larger community. Uh, yeah. So he says at, oh, uh, so, so we have these two normative centers, the polis and the family. Uh, the family is in one sense a natural unit in a way the polis is not. Immediate biological unit held together by bonds of sexual desire, of recognition, uh, and of uh, the subordination of children to parents. Uh, he says at 452, um, However, although the family is immediately determined, I already read this, uh, is an ethical entity only insofar as it goes beyond the natural uh, uh, distinction. Um, 
Uh, okay. So each of them puts norm, each of the communities puts normative demands on uh, its members. Uh, his claim is going to be that uh, the male in speaking for the family rises above the ethical demands, the normative demands of the family and responds to the normative demands, the law of uh, the polis, whereas the women remain speaking for uh, the law of the family community. And the original sin uh, of immediate Zitlikai, what will break it apart, what dooms it, uh, is this mistaking of the natural distinction between men and women as uh, intrinsically having the normative significance that makes one of them subject to uh, the laws of the polis and the other to the law of the family. Now, uh, here's the long... long passage. And this is really complicated. There's a lot going on in this passage. Um, progressive elements and retrogressive elements. But let me read it out. Thus human law in its universal existence, that is the community in general, is in its setting itself into activity, the manliness of the community. And in its actual activity is the government moving itself and sustaining itself by absorbing into itself the particular particularization of the penates, uh, that's the, the hearth to the family gods that's standing for the families. That is their self-sufficient individualization into different families over which women preside and by preserving them as dissolved within its fluidity's continuity. All right, he's describing the division of labor uh, between being responsible, not just principally, but essentially, and as who your character identifies with, with either the law of the polis or the law of the family uh, is seen as naturally uh, assigning these laws by the gender uh, differences. However, the family is in general at the same time, its element and its universal activating ground is individual consciousness. Okay, it's the families that are actually the units in the polis. Since the community gives itself enduring existence only by disrupting familial happiness and by dissolving self-consciousness into the universal, that is somebody going outside of the family and becoming subject to the demands uh, of the polis on behalf of the family, but uh, still, it creates an internal enemy for itself in what it suppresses and what is at the same time essential to it, femininity in general. Femininity is the community's eternal irony, the ewige Ironie des Gemeinwesens, he says. Women, Weiblichkeit, as the community's eternal irony. Changes by intrigue, the government's universal purpose into a private end, transforms its universal activity into this determinate individual's work and turns the state's universal property topsy-turvy into the family's possession and ornament. In this way, the feminine turns to ridicule the earnest wisdom of maturity, that is of men, which being dead to individuality, to pleasure and consumption, as well as to actual activity, this is qua political being, only thinks of and is concerned for the universal as the eternal source of irony, women will always ridicule the 
earnest wisdom of the males who have left uh, the family. Uh, she turns this mature wisdom into an object of ridicule for immature high-spirited youths and into an object of contempt for their enthusiasm. And she elevates in general youth's force into what counts as valid, elevating the son born to the mother as her master. The brother is one in whom the sister finds a man as an equal with herself and the youth through whom the daughter freed from her non-self-sufficiency achieves the enjoyment and the dignity of womanhood. The community, however, can only sustain itself by suppressing the spirit of individuality. The community can only maintain itself by suppressing this permanently ironic, uh, subversive uh, element, what it has made subversive by assigning a role based on uh, a natural difference of sex. Because that spirit is an essential moment, the community equally creates it by its repressive stance towards it as a hostile principle, as it's creating this eternal irony by its repressive stance to it as a hostile principle. Nevertheless, since this principle in separating itself from universal purposes is only evil, well, this is from the point of view of the polis, it's rejecting that law and making fun of it, is within itself nothing, it would be incapable of accomplishing anything if the community itself were not to recognize the force of youth. The manhood, which while still immature, is still subsumed under individuality. That is, the son who has not yet stepped out into the political role, but is still uh, subject to the ironic mockery of that role by the mother. Uh, but the polis is nothing without the force of the whole. For the community is a people, it is itself individuality, and it is only essentially for itself in that other individualities are for it, only in that it excludes these from itself and knows itself to be independent of. That is, the polis is a, a recognitive uh, community that is not asymmetric. So look, I say there's a lot going on in this passage. Uh, but I want to make the claim uh, that Hegel deserves a place, maybe with an asterisk, deserves a place in the pantheon of feminist theorists because of three aspects of what he's saying here. First, his diagnosis of gender essentialism as par paradigmatic and indeed as the original form of the deep mistake about traditional normativity by contrast to our modern understanding of it. That is, it's gender essentialism is uh, the paradigmatic form of, the characteristic form of, and indeed the origin of uh, the fundamental mistake of uh, treating natural, natural differences as having intrinsically normative significance, not appreciating as it will be essential to the modern to do uh, that natural differences have normative significance only insofar as we treat them as having that, that those are in fact products of our practices, not something baked in to the natural distinction itself. Uh, so, so here I think is uh, an insight. And second, his analysis of how this mistake is natural and inevitable in virtue of the role of the family as the primordial normative social community and the unit from which further such communities are built. Uh, it's because the family is uh, in this ambiguous position of being at once a natural unit and uh, the unit in which normativity first shows up the, in the form of the authority of parents over children, the responsibility of children to uh, parents. And finally, in Hegel's prediction of the stickiness of this identification of women's social roles with their familial roles as being 
a permanent irony uh, in the bosom of the community. And here, uh, I hope to get to uh, uh, later on today, uh, talk about the notion of irony as Friedrich Schlegel uh, had it, but uh, the short view is there, he identifies it with uh, embrace of contradictions on the one hand and with parabasis uh, on the other, parabasis being the feature of uh, old Greek theater where sometimes the chorus would step to the front, turn its back on the action that's happening within the play and would tell the audience things about what's going on that are not part of what's happening there. For instance, uh, connecting what's going on behind them in the play to then contemporary political things. It's like, oh, you see, when they make fun of Crayon, they're really making fun of, and then mentioning some contemporary political figure. That's Parabasis. And he's seeing, oh, uh, he's predicting that women because of this original sin in uh, uh, traditional society growing out of this role of the family uh, are a permanent source of irony in uh, uh, human society. Well, at least in modern as well as in uh, traditional. Now, uh, I have to tell you that uh, one time many years ago, I made this claim in a seminar just like this, uh, that uh, in virtue of uh, his analysis of uh, the role of gen the origin, nature, and fundamental mistaken mistake of uh, gender essentialism, that Hegel deserved a place in the pantheon of feminist theorists. And one of the more outspoken students, uh, young Irad Kimhi, uh, snorted. Uh, that was his response. I said, well, yes, Irad. Uh, and he said, by these same principles and standards of interpretation, I guess you would say that the Old Testament should count as a feminist work because it was Eve that ate the apple. And I've had a guilty conscience about this view ever since, uh, though it has not drawn me to relinquish the claim. Uh, I, I never make it without remembering this uh, response of uh, Irad's. Uh, now there is a big literature on the question of uh, just how much of a sexist bastard Hegel is. And there are plenty of things on the negative side of uh, the ledger. Uh, I think the guy deserves some cred uh, here and that uh, the philosophical notions that were to become uh, eventually uh, centrally important to uh, uh, our feminist understanding of uh, the relations between the personal and the political uh, get forwarded here. Uh, but uh, I wanted to sort of put this on the table. Uh, it's a consequence of his, I think, uh, penetrating analysis of the significance of the family as the original uh, normative unit and as making, not just tempting, but essentially inevitable, uh, the mistake of identifying uh, merely natural distinctions as having intrinsically normative significance, which is what we will see the, the uh, beginnings of the, of the inevitable demise of in uh, the allegory of Antigone. So, uh, it's time for our break. Uh, when we come back, I want to talk about reading the allegory uh, and in particular, the significance of burial uh, in it. And then I want to talk about the notion of irony 
uh, which, uh, you know, as we see, the identification of women as a social principle of irony within the community. This is just one uh, example, uh, but Hegel has, I think, a deep account of the doubly ironic character of Sophocles' play, uh, which is the background into which we would need to fit this, uh, uh, this earlier claim. So when we come back, I'll talk about burial uh, and about irony. Uh, it's 3.01, why don't we start up again at 3.15. So uh, I cut off when I did because I felt our time for a break was running out rather than because I didn't want to invite comments on this uh, outrageous claim that I was making that uh, in this passage where uh, Hegel says that the community uh, creates an internal enemy for itself in what it suppresses and what is at the same time essential to it, uh, womanhood in general, the community's eternal irony, and then skipping through it a little bit. Uh, uh, the community equally creates this enemy by its repressive added stance towards it as a hostile principle. That is that uh, womanhood is uh, going to be uh, an eternal irony and uh, a subversive enemy in the bosom of the uh, political community, so long as by virtue of this natural property of being female, uh, she is assigned a, a subordinate uh, normative position as uh, you know, properly staying in the realm of the family and not venturing out into the wider political world. And my claim was that should be enough as an identification to at least get uh, uh, Hegel some feminist uh, credit. Uh, anybody want to make an irad like comment about that or, or otherwise? Okay. Uh, so I said I wanted to talk about burial and uh, irony, and these are very closely related issues. So let me just uh, quickly rehearse uh, what happens in the allegory. Uh, as I say, I put a link to the play there, but I always assume that you are uh, massively intelligent, but possibly massively ignorant too about any particular topic I'm uh, addressing. So. Uh, in the previous installment of the story in Aeschylus's Seven Against Thebes, uh, Oedipus's uh, sons, Ateocles and Polynices, uh, he has refused to uh, treat one of them as the elder and therefore automatically inheriting his kingship. He said, you should take turns. So Ateocles will do it for a few years and then Polynices will do it. And Ateocles did it for a few years. And when Polynices said, it's my turn, Ateocles said, nah, I, I'm going to hold on to it. I, I, uh, I, I don't care what uh, Dad said uh, about this. And Polynices went off and raised a foreign army to come back and uh, uh, attack Thebes. Uh, he was one of the seven against Thebes, uh, but the others were foreigners, at least in that they were uh, not Thebans. Uh, so he had brought an outside army uh, in and uh, there were seven gates to Thebes and each of the seven leaders of the outside attacked one of them and each of the seven principal defenders defended one of them and Teocles defended the one that Polynices attacked. And we don't see any of the battle on the stage, we hear from the chorus afterwards that uh, both Polynices and Ateocles got killed uh, in it, but the furners were driven off. And it's decreed that because Polynices was a traitor to Thebes, he had, after all, brought foreign armies to conquer his own land, uh, that he couldn't be buried inside 
uh, uh, inside the walls. He couldn't be given a burial uh, as a Theban. Uh, his body was to be left uh, to, as Hegel says, the um, appetites of the birds and the dogs, um, to the merely natural appetite of the birds and the dogs. Uh, and so Crayon, uh, the uh, representative of the polis, uh, is uh, legally obliged to enforce this. Uh, you can't bury traitors, that's the law. Uh, that's something you lose when, when you uh, commit treason. Uh, Antigone, this is her brother, and it's part of the law of the family that you bury family members. So she's obliged by the law to bury him. Creon says, anyone, he's not allowed to be buried. Anyone who buries him has also violated this law is subject to death. And she, well, I can do no uh, other. And this is the uh, collision between them, treated one way by the Sophocles play that uh, Hegel's talking about, and in another way by, uh, we gather by Euripides. And you probably know the, uh, the Jean Anouy, a version of this uh, uh, stage during the Second World War, where it's um, uh, allegorical for uh, uh, French uh, civilians and the Nazi occupiers. Uh, okay, burial. What's the big deal about burial? Uh, so here are uh, the key passages. Uh, on this. Um, okay. The family interrupts the work of nature. It, and here's the quote, keeps away from the dead this dishonoring of him by unconscious appetites and abstract entities. Uh, they're abstract in that they have no normative status and puts its own action in their place. The family thereby makes him a member of a community which prevails over and holds under control the forces of particular material elements and the lower forms of life which sought to unloose themselves against him and to destroy him. Death, in another passage, death is a state which has been reached immediately in the course of nature and not the result of an act conscious action consciously done. The duty of the member of a family is on that account to add this aspect in order that the individual's ultimate being too shall not belong to nature and remain something irrational, but shall be something done and the right of consciousness shall be asserted in it. And then again, he says uh, at 486, even the departed spirit is present in his blood relationship in the self of the family. The question, and here we should think back to the struggle unto death. The question is, is Polynices an animal or is he a human being? Is he a person, a member of the community, someone with a normative status, a normative subject? of uh, authority and responsibility of normative statuses. Uh, he's going to be devoured as just dead meat, a dead animal uh, by the other animals who treat him as they treat uh, other animals. Uh, that's the death of an animal. And that's what the law of the polis dictates is the appropriate treatment of a traitor. Uh, he showed that he never was one of us, uh, a member of the community. Uh, that recognition is precisely what he rejected by uh, committing what no one contests is treason uh, against the community, bringing foreigners in to uh, conquer it. Uh, Antigone in, in no way uh, contests that this was treason. And the law says, then you never were a member of the community. You were just an evil animal. Uh, and this is the outward visible recognition uh, of that. 
as you rejected, uh, refused to recognize us uh, by uh, committing this act, we constitutively refuse to recognize you. Uh, so your normative status is uh, as though it had never existed. But the job of the family is to make it that members of the family are members of the family of that uh, normative community, not merely animals. And the act of burial is an act of recognition of that, that uh, though in the end, the state of nature, uh, you know, there's, there's been this huge natural change between a living being and uh, a dead one, but it's the absolute responsibility of uh, the family members as members of that community uh, to make it that that merely natural occurrence, the death of the animal, did not in any way revoke your membership in the community, the community of the family. Uh, the burial is a constitutive recognition that you're still one of us. Your status has changed from being a living member of that community to being a dead one, uh, but honored as an ancestor, uh, recognized still as uh, still one of us, just in this uh, distinctive status of being a dead one of us. But it's essential to uh, the conception of the family, that it has this historical significance. People can pass from the status of being living members of the community to being dead ones and still be recognized as members of uh, the community. So he says, this is turning uh, something that merely happens, the death of the individual, and here it doesn't matter whether somebody killed him or you know, he died of disease. Death is something that happens. It's a natural change of state, but it doesn't have an intrinsic normative significance. Uh, it doesn't have the significance of cutting you off from the family or of expelling you uh, from the family. The job of the other family members, their responsibility is to turn something that otherwise would merely have happened into something that's consciously done. The burial, which is the constitutive recognition of you as still a normative subject, even though, you know, as a dead one, there's some things you can't do that only the live ones uh, can do. But the status of the ancestor is constitutive of uh, the family as surviving the death of the animals who are its particular members as individual members of the community, they still have a recognitive, uh, they still have a recognitive status. And the ones who are recognizing uh, that dead one uh, are doing so in the hope, the expectation indeed, as I wanna put it in the trust, that they will continue to be so recognized when they uh, undergo this merely natural change uh, as well. So, the, the key to reading this allegory is that burial is an act of recognition. And it's a constitutive act of recognition. It makes you still be a member of the community if you're properly buried, properly recognized uh, as such. And it makes you not a member of the community if you're unburied, if you're left your body is left outside the city walls to be uh, made a meal of, treated as an animal by the animals. Uh, so the family has to interrupt the work of nature, substituting its action for the action of those animals. And uh, this has uh, a constitutive uh, significance. Uh, now, here's another passage um, from 466 uh, about 
the collision between Antigone and uh, Creon, each representing the set of norms of their community, he says, because on the one hand, the ethical order essentially consists in this immediate firmness of decision, that's what he called character. And for that reason, there is for consciousness essentially only one law. Well, on the other hand, the ethical zitlich powers are real and effective in the self of consciousness. These powers acquire the significance of excluding and opposing one another. The zitlich consciousness, because it is decisively for one of the two powers, identifies unto death, as we see with Creon and uh, Antigone, uh, identifies with either the polis or the family, the Zitle consciousness, because it is decisively for one of the two powers, is essentially character. It does not accept that both have the same essential nature. For this reason, the opposition between them appears as an unfortunate collision of duty merely with a reality which possesses no rights of its own. Each one identifies with a law, and the rest is just lawlessness. You're acting out of uh, your identification with attitudes, either throwing your weight around as uh, an official of the polis or uh, your bonds of affection as a family member, but you're letting that override uh, the norms. So from each side, they just see a one-sided collision between uh, duty and inclination of uh, one kind or another. For this reason, the opposition between them appears as an unfortunate collision of duty, merely with a reality which possesses no rights of its own, mere attitudes. Since it sees right only on one side and wrong on the other, that consciousness which belongs to the divine law sees in the other side only the violence of human caprice. Well, that which holds to the human law sees in the other only self-will and the disobedience of the individual who insists on being his own authority. So uh, another passage, uh, these Zitlich characters, these avatars of who decisively identify with and act for the institutional aspect of some normative community, for them, this is at 597 now, character, that ethical consciousness, Zitlich, which on account of its immediacy is a specifically determined spirit, belongs only to one of the ethical essentialities. The audience can see that there's a law on each side uh, and that there's a conflict between them, but it's essential that the characters not. Uh, so there's this uh, distinction between the consciousness of the characters in the play and the, the consciousness of uh, the audience. And that distancing from the normative situation on the play, that's one of the senses of irony uh, in which irony is an essentially modern um, uh, uh, phenomenon, uh, an essentially modern attitude towards uh, the norms because you're seeing that the audience is seeing um, not just the norms, but uh, that the constitutive attitudes of the players, Antigone and Creon, towards those norms, uh, that it's a matter of their identification with one norm rather than the other, that we're seeing uh, colliding. So that uh, irony, that uh, sophisticated view of the significance of attitudes for norms uh, is part of what Sophocles is doing on purpose. Right? It's essential to what he's doing, a kind of thing that Aeschylus never did. So, Hegel, so Hegel's reading is. Uh, Sophocles was more modern, uh, a generation more modern than Aeschylus, in that he precisely presented this 
uh, lesson uh, made available this lesson for the audiences that uh, the collision is because Antigone identifies with unto death uh, the law of one community, the family, and Creon identifies to the death that is willing to sacrifice their animal being for, if need be, for uh, fulfilling their responsibilities as members of the polis, and that it's their identification with them that makes those uh, laws efficacious. They, the characters, don't see that. They just see one law binding on everyone and someone who is acting uh, out of capricious particular attitudes rather than out of the duty that uh, plainly exists. So in that, Hegel says, we've got the kind of ironic distance from the norm, the appreciation of the dependence of the norm, the status, on our attitudes uh, that is precisely denied by immediate Zittlichkeit, uh, whose constitutive take on the norms is that they are just there and our attitudes uh, uh, are dependent on them. They are independent of uh, our attitudes. So that's the first layer of irony that Hegel sees in this play. This is, uh, I think, a fabulous reading of this, uh, of this play. Uh, here's the second level of irony that's uh, involved in here. What is the, what's constitutive of the uh, immediately Zitlich picture of norms is that they're not at all up to us. Uh, our attitudes are bound by them, are subject to assessment as correct or incorrect according to them, but no one's attitudes had anything to do with instituting, uh, with instituting these things. Um, but uh, what is it that they're willing to fight and if need be die over? Well, it's burial. Why? Because burial is a, the expression of a practical attitude. It's a doing that constitutes, that institutes a normative status. If Polynices is buried, that makes him not just an animal. It makes him never have just been an animal. It makes him always have been a member of the community, indeed, both communities, the family and Thebes. Uh, that's why Creon can't allow it, because burying him would be a constitutive recognition of him as not just the animal, the traitor, but as a Theban. And that's why Antigone has to bury him, because that will make him a normative member of the family and always have been, and not just a dead animal. That is, each of them realizes that burial is constitutive of the normative status of Polynices. It's an act of recognition that will make him a member of the community by practically taking him as a member of the community. It's an attitude that institutes a status. But it isn't supposed to be like that. Normative status is my station and my duties. That's not supposed to be something that's changed by anybody's attitudes. The attitudes are just supposed to reflect what the statuses are. And yet, just in their conflict, uh, both 
Antigone and Creon are treating their actions as constituting the normative status, as instituting uh, Polynices as either just an animal, if he's not buried, or as making him uh, a member of both these communities if he is buried. So what they're fighting over is not something that's in principle visible from the point of view of their official and indeed practical understanding of normativity. Now, so, so there's a deep collision between uh, their understanding of what they're doing, not just between their understanding of what they're doing and, and what the audience can see, but each of them has actually got uh, incoherent views of what's going on. Officially, they have the uh, view that the norms are simply there, the law is what it is, and we're just uh, to act according to it or not. But also, in being committed unto death, to burying or seeing to it that he's not buried, depending, they're practically acknowledging in the strongest possible way the constitutive character of their attitudes to the normative statuses. So I think Hegel sees that second irony, the sense in which they're not just colliding with each other, uh, what the audience can see, uh, characterized differently than what they see about their collision, uh, but the sense in which uh, the views they're acting on are fundamentally at odds with one another, incompatible with one another, each of them internally. And I think in that, Hegel sees, well, I'll quote again, maybe I'll get it right this time, the little rift within the lute that by and by shall make the music mute and ever widening slowly silence all that is the division between attitude and status that is modernity. He sees the English garden there in this feature of the play. He sees the thin leading edge of the wedge of modernity, of a kind of self-consciousness about the norms that make them what they are, that when it becomes full-fledged, uh, when it blossoms, will be uh, the transformation to modernity, something that has the character that it happens slowly bit by bit, and then all of a sudden, that's the way uh, modernity is coming. And the question, I think this raises, I mean, this is my reading of where Hegel is leaving, is why he thinks this is uh, seeing modernity here. Question, did Sophocles see that? Did Sophocles see the collision between burial as a constitutive act, making somebody into a community member or not, which if that isn't true, there's nothing for them to fight over. Right? Did he see that that was deeply incompatible with the understanding of normativity, that he has his characters eloquently give voice to? And as a secondary question, did Hegel think Sophocles saw that? Um, you, you can see why I'm saying that the layers of irony are piling on one another here. 
there's things going on behind the scenes and different levels of awareness of them. Hegel thinks that we can read these plays better than any ancients could read them because we know where it's going. We're looking back from the transition to modernity and can see uh, these as first sparks of modernity uh, in there uh, in a way they could not have the eyes to see in the way that uh, somebody in uh, the 1780s couldn't see uh, the fad for English gardens as uh, the beginning of what would be the wave of romanticism. Uh, they couldn't, we, we, we can look back and maybe see that. Um, but uh, the nature and levels of self-consciousness about these things that are going on. I mean, it seems to me that once things are put the way I have, uh, you can see that it's absolutely fundamental to Sophocles' play that uh, these characters who are committed to attitudes being independent, sorry, being totally dependent on normative statuses, on the laws, the laws being completely independent of uh, the statuses, in fact, are fighting over burial of why does it matter? Because those practical attitudes determine the norm. Oh, that is an essential part of what's going on in the play. Oh, and yet it's not clear that even Sophocles saw that about it. Oh, he was modern malgré lui. Oh, And, and that's a dimension along which uh, Hegel thinks Euripides, when he does things like that, uh, he's knowing that he's doing that. He's seeing uh, a form of life breaking down um, through its internal contradictions. Uh, Euripides means to be portraying that. Sophocles is portraying that, but there's no evidence that he knew that he was, that, that he meant to do that. Uh, that was sort of happening in this. Now, I say that the allegories have this different status in the spirit section, in that the allegories are now the explicit expression of the thematic self consciousness of the characters, the way they, uh, of the uh, people at the stage in the development of Geist that he's talking about, this is how they express their understanding of normativity, uh, was in these um, uh, literary productions that Hegel is going to read as allegorical for the, uh, uh, for the time. I mean, for modernity, the perfect one is Rameau's nephew. And we'll say something about that uh, uh, next time. Uh, but he's going to read uh, his contemporary literature, works of literature, as uh, expressing the modern uh, sensibility. Well, often in the way Sophocles expressed the traditional one, but sometimes in the way Euripides did. Uh, Full-blown romanticism is sort of fully alienated uh, modernity. Um, anyway, uh, I see this sort of multiply layered now reading of the literature. Um, uh, it, it's surely by anybody's standards, a brilliant reading of this uh, play, but he's also uh, you know, seeing it as 
uh, articulating in these various senses of explicitness, articulating the large scale change in the structure of normativity and of our self-consciousness, our awareness of those structures that is you know, the topic of uh, his history of Geist, the change from uh, traditional to modern. And uh, it's a rare thing, it seems to me, uh, to read a work of philosophy uh, that includes sophisticated treatments of the way in which Dykes presupposes anaphora and the ways in which one could misunderstand uh, laws of nature as super facts uh, when he's doing and criticizing the myth of the given when he's doing epistemology uh, that could uh, thematize the transition from asymmetric uh, normative structures uh, of the subordination obedience kind to reciprocal recognitive uh, egalitarian ones and could uh, give this sort of nuanced literary reading of uh, some of the great works of the past. As I say, he has a whole view about all these guys. Uh, and uh, even to the point of seeing the three plays in Sophocles' uh, Oedipus trilogy as progressing through you know, in, in Oedipus not being sort of being Aeschylean and um, Oedipus the King as being Sophoclean and Oedipus at Colonna when the bitter old blind man is looking back uh, as being Euripidean. Uh, and in this regard, I will mention that um, uh, an important Euripides play for him is the Bacchae, uh, which is when women as the dangerous repressed uh, dimension of society really get their revenge. Uh, Euripides is making explicit uh, what is uh, at best implicit in uh, the Sophoclean uh, treatment of um, of gender essentialism. Uh, so, so Hegel has got a sophisticated view of you know, the great Greek uh, tragedians, but is deploying that sensibility with uh, uh, serious metaphysical uh, philosophical intent. I mean, it's the metaphysics of normativity, of discourse, of discursiveness. Uh, and um, uh, I think one of the um, one of the reasons this is a great work of philosophy is the range of uh, things that he brings into a single story. Okay, let me stop there. This is laying a lot on you, but uh, you know, I hope at least to motivate you to reread some of this stuff. The Hegel, maybe back to the plays, maybe to my uh, discussions of some of it. Yeah, I'm gotcha. Um, from your question, um, if Sophocles did recognize this uh, incommensurability, I ask myself if the um, audience should recognize it. And I think um, they, they shouldn't because um, a tragedy should have this moment of catharsis. And this is only um, um, kind of um, uh, acceptance that uh, there's a conflict which cannot be resolved. And um, uh, this wouldn't be so effective if, the, um, if they would recognize this, this um, uh, incompatibility between um, uh, at, uh, um, status, um, statuses are instituted by attitudes and um, clinging to the, those statuses. Well, I, I think that's right. I, I, I think uh, uh, it, it wouldn't be so effective and so uh, can have been what Sophocles was aiming at. Uh, Hegel's articulating for her this, here the sense in which the audience couldn't 
have seen this about it. They didn't have the conceptual set in which you could uh, uh, make sense of this that way. For that, you have to be, you know, have experienced the alienation, the attitudes towards uh, normativity that we moderns have got. It's something that essentially is only visible retrospectively, recollectively. Uh, it, it, it is constitutive of us understanding them better than they uh, understood themselves. And I think that's right. James? So a related question, I wonder about the fate of tragedy in the uh, age of trust in the postmodern stage of normativity, because you might think that it's sort of constitutive of the tragedy uh, of Antigone, that one is willing to sacrifice one's merely animal self for the sake of a normative status that is sublime in, in sort of Rorty's sense that has this kind of sub sublime extra human status. And you might worry that the recognition that Hegel is urging on us would turn us into sort of Rorty and ironists for whom like the notion of a tragic sacrifice of this sort would just be sort of um, sort of silly. Or, or I think of Hume who's sort of perfectly happy to recite the Lord's Prayer if the locals will help him get out of the slough that he's stuck in because the norm is means nothing to him or rather he's aware of its sort of contingency. So anyways, I mean, is there a prospect for a, for a renewal of tragedy or is that concept sort of out of altogether? Well, uh, big question, <laughs> James. And, uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, I mean, it seems to me that uh, in modernity, we have not only the Rortian ironist uh, who's disengaging, uh, which is uh, you know, already a figure visible to, uh, to Hegel. That is, he, he already sees people taking that sort of disengaged ironic view, uh, but also the existentialist take uh, on this, which would say, no, you could understand this uh, as, uh, you know, what they're committed to as not uh, uh, responding to any non-human law uh, and still identify with your commitment, your attitude unto death uh, in the uh, act gratuit, uh, in the uh, appreciation that all there is to give things meaning is our commitment. Uh, to them, that there isn't anything deeper uh, than that. Uh, that's equally an expression of modern alienation uh, as the saying, well, so it's, it's not worth sacrificing anything, identifying with anything uh, at all. Those are sort of the two polar uh, expressions of uh, alienation. And the, the challenge you're offering is, well, is the, the sketch that uh, I can see my way clear to of uh, the postmodern stage of the reachievement of uh, heroic agency. Well, I took it without tragedy. Uh, I, I take it that the tragedy is something you overcome by that. Not, not that bad stuff doesn't happen, but that's a debauched, deflated modern use of tragedy. It just means, oh, it's really bad. Uh, that, that is losing the uh, uh, conceptual richness of the original notion of, uh, uh, of tragedy, which is that uh, the consequences of our actions, the things that we can justifiably in some sense be held responsible for, always and in principle outrun uh, what we can know or intend. That's the tragic, tragic aspect of the heroic uh, consciousness. And there is going to be a form of that, but uh, it's now the community that's supposed to take responsibility for that uh, on your behalf. And so I would say it's, uh, no, that the, the, the postmodern age of trust is uh, beyond tragedy, but has reachieved heroism. That's the way I think about it. Uh, now, does, does that mean their literature is impoverished by having this possibility completely uh, cut off from it? 
I mean, I heard that as partly implicit in what you said. And uh, gee, I don't know. That sounds bad. I, I hope not. But uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know what to say about that. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, that is our time. Next time is Hegel's astonishing discussion of uh, the relationship between faith and enlightenment. Uh, how he thinks we should overcome uh, the twin forms of alienation uh, that are expressed in uh, modern religion and modern enlightenment uh, as well. Uh, and see our way to uh, uh, a synthetic way forward for them, or at least see uh, how they've got paired failures to understand, uh, how they're more specifically cognitive and recognitive uh, commitments are out of step uh, with each other, uh, which is our first clue towards uh, a postmodern uh, reappropriation. Uh, but that's modernity, that's next time. Uh, 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 be safe and well, and I will see you then.